Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. I am really bad with jargon, in the sense that I, I just hate it. Jargon, by its very nature, is exclusive. If you don't know the language, if you don't know the codes, if you don't know the usage rules, then you're locked out of the discussion. I remember one financial guy who wanted to talk to me about a retirement savings plan, and his spiel went something like this. When it comes to diversification of your asset classes, consider taking on some warrants on pink sheet stocks in the VIX, backing them up with shorts on FANG stocks for a few months before rebalancing your portfolio through dollar cost averaging. I have no idea what I just said. Now let's switch to music. If you do any exploring of how the music business works, you inevitably run into words that seem important, but you don't really know what they mean. Now you could ask, but then that might show that you're, you know, lacking in knowledge. You know, newbie, ignoramus, rookie. Nobody wants to be called that, so you keep it all to yourself. Nobody wants to be made fun of. And if someone does deign to explain things to you, there's always the risk that they'll be condescending. So you just say to yourself, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out myself eventually, I hope. But that's not right. I think music should be for everyone. So if you're interested in how things work with the recorded music industry, your curiosity should be rewarded. And that's what we're going to do right now. This is an audio glossary of music industry terms. And once we're done, you'll be able to converse with the best of them. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. The Sex Pistols, from 1977, taking a swipe at a former record company after everything went south after just five days. Hello there, I'm Alan Cross, and I'm here to help you learn a new language, the language of the recorded music industry. We're going to go through a bunch of terms I know that you've heard or read before, but may still be a little confused by what they mean and why those terms are so important to understanding how the industry works. And then for fun, we'll dip into a playlist featuring songs written about the music industry, like, uh, well, the Sex Pistols song we just heard. And it's strange how most of them don't have many nice things to say. But anyway, I think the best way to present this glossary of musical industry terms is to go about things in alphabetical order. And where necessary and appropriate, we'll just riff off through some different tangents, okay? The first term that we're going to tackle is A and R. A and R stands for Artists and Repertoire. This is the department of a record label tasked with finding new artists and new songs. Once they find someone, be it an individual or a band, they are responsible for signing them to a contract, helping them sort through the material to record, and then following the artist through the entire recording process. So basically, they're talent scouts. It used to be that A&R involved a lot of late nights in smoky bars and listening to a lot of bad music before somebody good came along. A&R people are also the ones who went through all the demos that were sent to the label. So stacks and stacks and stacks of tapes or CDRs or whatever. And yes, those two things are still very much part of the job. But now that the internet is here, a lot of talent searching can be done online. You know, YouTube and Facebook and SoundCloud and Bandcamp. These are all sites that are searched regularly by A&R folk looking for that next big thing. It can be mind-numbing, but it becomes worth it when you find that band or that singer. Now, take the case of the Arctic Monkeys. They came to the attention of a lot of record labels as the result of fans posting their early do-it-yourself recordings to MySpace. Same thing with Panic at the Disco. Justin Bieber, Alessia Cara, Carly Rae Jepsen, The Weeknd, Ed Sheeran, Shawn Mendes, they were all first found on YouTube. It's really, really tough to be an a and because your job is to find talent that will capture the public's attention. In other words, talent that will make money for your label. And if you run into a dry patch, your position could be in trouble. A&R is also highly competitive. If you're in the game, you're up against many, many, many other people, many other A&R dudes and dudettes facing the same pressure. Get it wrong too many times or lose out on assigning too often and you're out. 
Artists also need to worry about the well-being of their A&R person. They are your champion at the label. If they get cut loose, chances are the label will completely lose interest in you too. Not only do you no longer have someone in charge of your development at the label, there's nobody there to champion you, you also become tainted with the A&R person's failure. And human nature being what it is, no one wants that stink. So it's, it's pretty vicious. But then there are superstars of A&R. Take Nate Albert. He was the one who found The Weeknd and then fended off more than two dozen competing offers to sign him to Capital Music Group. And here's a fun fact. Nate is a former member of the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. He played guitar on songs like this. The next term in our recorded music industry glossary is advance. When an A&R person signs an artist to a contract, the deal includes paying the act some money up front to help get them started until money starts flowing in from the record deal. It's a loan. This money has to be paid back. Well, how? Well, kind of like garnishing wages. Everything you spend out of your advance is charged against you and against any money you might make from your record deal until that loan is paid off. This is called a recoupable advance. The label has the right to claw back the money it lent you to get you started. Now, for many bands, this results in a vicious circle. For whatever reason, they never make enough money to pay off that first advance. So when it comes time to make a second album, they get another advance, which can actually put them deeper in the hole. For groups, it's like a series of student loans that, that never end. However, we do have to look at it from the other side. A record label works in a very high-risk environment. The label can never be sure that a signing will ever make them any money. It makes a big, big bet on an act at the earliest stages of its career. So there are zero guarantees behind handing out this loan. If the act fails to catch on, the label cuts them loose. And at that point, any advances are considered to be bad debts and the label loses money. And just to show you how risky this is, the often quoted ratio of label signings goes something like this. Out of 30 signings to a record label, 20 will lose money, seven will break even, and the last three will make enough money to pay for everybody else. Not very good odds, right? But so goes the culture industry. Ah, from The Selector from 1980 with Three Minute Hero. And by the way, that song clocks in at exactly three minutes. Our next term is CanCon. Now, I know you've heard this one before. CanCon is short for Canadian content. And since 1971, Canadian radio stations have been required to devote a percentage of their playlist to music of Canadian origin. This is to prevent Canadian musicians from being swamped by foreign music and it ensures that Canadian music is heard on the radio in Canada. It ensures that Canadian music is heard on the radio, and it also forced the Canadian music industry to grow up, actually to come into being. Before 1971, there really wasn't much of a music industry in this country, but once the government required that Canadian radio play Canadian music, an industry grew up around that. It took a while, a couple of decades actually, but the policy did work. And now Canada exports far more music to the world than a country of our size should. Some of the biggest artists on the planet are from here. Other countries look at Canada and wonder, wow, what's, uh, what's in the water up there? This leads us to a related term called MAPL, which is spelled M-A-P-L. This stands for Music, Artist, Production, and Lyrics. You may have seen this symbol somewhere on a CD or vinyl record. It's a circle divided into four quarters, and each quarter is reserved for one of those letters. For a song to be officially considered Canadian content, it has to meet two of those criteria. It's all very bureaucratic, which sometimes results in some strange loopholes and exceptions, but it is the law of the land. Now, let me give you an example. Let's look at Lenny Kravitz, his cover of the Guess Who's American Woman. Now, Lenny was born in New York. He's definitely an American. 
The song was produced by an American in an American recording studio. So the A and the P in Maple are eliminated. However, the music and the lyrics, the M and the L, are both very, very Canadian. Both were written by four members of the Guess Who. Ergo, Lenny Kravitz is technically Canadian, at least for the purposes of this song. Lenny Kravitz and an illustration of how strange Canadian content rules can be for radio in this country. We'll continue our music industry glossary with more from the letter C in just a second. This is the music industry glossary, a look at terms that will help you speak like a professional label weasel. Next up is catalog. This is the division of a record company that deals with older, non-current music. This covers material by artists who are no longer active, and it also means any music that is no longer being actively promoted, which means it's at least 18 to 24 months old. Looking at it the other way, the catalog department takes over when A&R has finished their work. Speaking of which, that's another reason A&R is so important to a label. Today's new music becomes tomorrow's catalog, which can hopefully be sold and otherwise exploited for eternity for the benefit of both the company and the artist. Now, in the olden days, artists could retire and make a very nice living based on catalog sales. For example, before the internet came along and ruined everything, every single Doors album sold a million copies a year, even though the band came to an end in 1973. The Beastie Boys saw nice checks from sales of License to Ill because this 1986 record sold at least two million every year. But with the collapse of record sales and the rise of streaming, legacy artists, this is what we call these older acts, aren't making anywhere near what they used to from sales. So this explains why so many artists, people who are in their 60s and 70s now, are still on the road playing gigs. Touring has become their main source of income. Under most contractual situations, the artist does not own the rights to their catalog. That stays with the label. This means the label is free to offer reissues of older albums, release digital remasters, and special expanded editions of old records. New vinyl editions are becoming increasingly popular. And then we have the most lucrative and high-margin product of all, the box set. Now, box sets don't sell in huge numbers, but super fans buy them, and the profits can be extraordinary. I'm a, a sucker for these things because they often include material that's not available anywhere else. You know, remixes, live tracks, demos, books, expanded liner notes, bits of swag, posters, stickers, fake backstage passes, 5.1 mixes for home theaters, DVDs, Blu-ray discs. I, I've got at least a half dozen Beatles and Pink Floyd box sets in my collection. There's a Depeche Mode collection from 2008 that a fan can lose themselves in for days and uh, looking here at the shelf, I have boxes from Snow Patrol, Stereophonics, Joy Division, and New Order. Uh, here's one that details the history of goth, and another that tells the story of shoegaze. Uh, here's one with highlights from Electra Records over the decades. The one that looks like a Marshall amp is the history of metal. I've got, uh, what, Smiths, Velvet Underground, a couple from The Clash, three from Elvis Costello, a bunch from U2. Okay, let's, let's take something off the shelf at random. This is uh, from the box set version of Pearl Jam's Live on Two Legs from 2011. It's a collection of live material recorded between 2003 and 2010, plus a bunch of photos and posters. There's a CD and a double vinyl version. It's nice. Still working on the letter C with our music industry glossary, we come to the term contract. Now, this is fairly simple. Just about everybody knows what a contract is. This is a written agreement between two parties that spells out the obligations and responsibilities each agrees to fulfill in a business arrangement that will run for a certain term. In the old days, record contracts covered mainly the details between a label and an artist when it came to making and selling records. That's how labels made money, by selling records. But selling records is no longer a very good business. This is why the old standard contracts are increasingly being phased out in favor of something called a 360 deal. 
anybody signing a deal today will see the label take a piece of the action, not just from record sales, but from all income streams. That means a cut of touring revenue, money from merch, money from publishing, money from streaming, the whole thing. Now, on one hand, this looks like the label is reaching deeper and deeper and deeper into the artist's pockets, but it also gives the label more of an incentive to make sure that the act succeeds on every level. And it also forces the label to play a longer game when it comes to the artists. So the artists can enjoy a greater measure of security than with the old style contract that relied almost exclusively on how many records you sold. Now take a band like The Beaches. I'm gonna guess, I don't know for sure, but I'm gonna guess that they have a 360 with their label. It's just the way things are done these days. One more music industry term brought to you by the letter C, and that's copyright. This is one of the very foundational principles of any creative industry. Copyright literally means the right to copy. Whoever owns the copyright on something has the absolute legal and exclusive right to determine who can and cannot copy that something or who can and cannot use that something for financial gain. It is a form of intellectual property rights. In the case of music, copyright protects composers from their music being ripped off by somebody else. When artists sign a deal, they assign the copyright of their music to the label. The label then has exclusive right to copy and distribute that music. If you would like permission to do something with that music, you must go through the label, the copyright owner, and pay for the right. Now, we, of course, could write books on the concept of copyright, but let me give you a concrete example of this can work. This show is also available as a podcast. However, the podcast form does not contain the full songs that you hear in the radio show. That's because we cannot get copyright permission to include the songs in the podcast. We just include a little clip for demonstration purposes. A podcast is a form of copying and distribution. We have the copyright of me talking to you just like this and all the other bits that you hear as part of this show, but we don't have the copyright on the songs. And because there is yet no mechanism for us to acquire copyright permission for including music in something like a podcast, okay, well, don't get me started, we can't include the music. It's a long, ugly, weird story. We just can't use the songs. So if you're listening to the radio show, you're about to hear a song I really like from another box set. And we're going to go one from the Tragically Hip special edition of Fully Completely. And we're going to do this because, um, and I really like this box set because I wrote most of the liner notes. If you're listening to the podcast, you'll hear a couple of seconds of me humming. <laughs> I'm just humming randomly because I can't even reproduce somebody's melody because that would be a violation of copyright. <laughs> there, good, huh? Well, I hope that explains the concept of copyright. And coming next, we'll move to the letter D and beyond as we continue with our music industry glossary. This is part one of a demystification of music industry terms, a glossary of words that you may see or hear thrown around when discussing the business of music. And yes, it is like learning a new language. We are up to the letter D, and D is for demo. And I know you've heard this one before. Demo is short for demonstration. It's a recording made by an artist to demonstrate what they can do and what their music sounds like. Demos come in all kinds of forms. It can be something recorded on a cassette in your bedroom. It can be something assembled on a laptop using a program like GarageBand. Or it can be a full studio recording self-financed by the artist. Demos can be works in progress, a way for a song to evolve and mutate into its finished form. Or a demo could be used to shop the artist to record labels, managers, agents, and venues. A lot of fans love demos because it offers a window into the creative process. Some artists are okay with making these works in progress public. Others aren't so crazy about it because they know the song is unfinished and not ready for prime time because it's not their best stuff. Record labels also tend to love demos because this is material that can be used for reissues and expanded editions of albums and box sets. So here's an example. This is the sort of material Florence Welch of Florence and the Machine shopped around before she was eventually signed. An A&R person heard something in this recording and, well, the rest is history. 
This is a demo of Dog Days Are Over. See if you can pick out the differences between the version we all know, the one we've heard on the radio for years, and this one. A demo version of Dog Days Are Over from Florence and the Machine. A little less refined than the final recording that we know today, but still, it's a really cool bit of insight into the creative process, isn't it? Now we're going to skip to the letter I for another abbreviation, and that is ISRC. Now this is a bit arcane, but it's growing more and more important in the digital age. First, we need to back up just a little bit. If you look at any book, like any book on your shelf, you will find a 10 or 13 digit number somewhere on the cover or inside the front or back pages. This is called the ISBN, the International Standard Book Number. Every book has one. It is the book's unique identifier and is standard all over the world. And this is the way we keep track of the world's books, each edition and each variation. If you write a book, the hardcover, the paperback and the ebook will all have unique ISBNs, and this is the way we've been doing things since 1967. ISRC stands for International Standard Recording Code, and it does the same thing for music as ISBNs do for books. This numbering scheme, there are 12 characters in each code, came into use starting in 1986. And as more time passes, the more complicated this has become. And this is because each recording gets its own ISRC number. Every recording of a song, every remix, every edit, every version gets its own ISRC number. The goal is to one day have a universal database of recording so that anyone anywhere can identify any recording for the purposes of copyright. And ISRC numbers get applied to any audio, songs, audiobooks, officially released interviews, everything. This numbering system is increasingly important in the digital age when it comes to getting paid. The artist, the producer, the remixer, the composers, the label, the publisher, everybody associated with the creation of that particular recording needs to be paid. If an exact recording cannot be properly identified, people risk not being paid for its use. Let's dig into an example using Muse and their song Dig Down. The ISRC of this recording is GB AHT 1700303. So GB AHT 1700303. The GB is the two character code denoting which country issued the number. GB stands for Great Britain. So pretty straightforward. The AHT stands for the entity that registered this number, the rights holder of this recording. And in this case, I think it stands for Helium 3, the band's label, which is distributed by Warner Music Group. The 17 is the year the number was assigned, and the 00303 is the unique designation code assigned to that song. In a perfect digital world, this code should be embedded into every single recording so every one of them can be immediately identified. If there is a remix, you get another code for that remix, and so on and so on and so on. This, however, is not the case. There are still very big gaps in the database because, uh, well, just think about how many audio recordings exist in the universe. And every single one of them needs a number unique to it. Start, though, right? So there are a few music industry terms, but there are still plenty that we haven't covered. Things like publishing, performing rights organization, sync, all the different sorts of royalties, metadata. But all that will be covered on part two, which is coming up next time. Meanwhile, if there are some terms you need defined and identified, let me know through alan at alancross.ca and we'll work it in. Podcasts of this program are available wherever you get your on-demand audio. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, Podbean, Overcast, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, everywhere. Uh, ratings and sharing are encouraged. 
If you want more, there's my website, which is a journal of musical things.com. It's updated every day and comes with a free newsletter that keeps you updated on what's happening in music. It's a really great resource. We can also connect through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Love to talk to you somehow. See you next time for part two of our music industry glossary. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.